A new era is dawning on Cuba. On April 19th, Cuba's National Assembly came together to officially elect the nation's next president. It was the second leadership change in the communist country since 1959. And for the first time in nearly six decades, the new leader isn't a Castro. I'm Judah with Now This World, and in today's episode, we're looking back at the Castro's legacy and asking the question, what's next for Cuba? First, in order to know where they're headed, let's start with where they've been, Fidel Castro. Fidel Castro first came to power in 1959 after orchestrating a coup that ousted the nation's US-backed dictator. Soon after Castro took control of Cuba, located just over 100 miles off the shores of the United States, he established the first communist state in the Western Hemisphere. During the 1960s, the Republic of Cuba continued to align itself with the Soviet Union, a move that raised a lot of red flags in the United States. Castro also allowed the Soviet Union to begin secretly storing nuclear-capable ballistic missiles in Cuba. Eventually, the missiles were removed from the island, but tensions with its neighbor to the north would remain high. The United States broke off all diplomatic ties to the island nation and imposed a number of sanctions which officially banned all trade and commercial activity between the nations. That embargo negatively affected the economic and social lives of Cubans. Castro's rule didn't only have international implications, it also affected domestic affairs. He set up a one-party political system, taking control of every aspect of Cuban life, expanding the nation's social services to everyone free of charge. According to Human Rights Watch, Castro also had a track record of repression. During his rule, thousands of Cubans were incarcerated in, quote, abysmal prisons, thousands were harassed, and an entire generation lacked basic political freedom in his one-party country. His policies also led to an exodus of Cubans to the United States. After Castro began confiscating lands, many upper and middle class people fled the nation. Cuban residents were also caught off from the outside world. He banned all information flow into and out of the country. And this is how the people of Cuba lived for nearly five decades under Fidel. In 2006, when his health began to decline, he provisionally turned over power to his brother, Raul. In 2008, Fidel Castro officially resigned and handed the presidency over to his younger brother. Although Raul was considered a hardline communist, some experts viewed him as a more pragmatic leader than his elder brother. And those experts might have been right. Just a few months in, he had lifted a nationwide ban on the private ownership of mobile phones and computers, announced a reversal of a policy that mandated equal pay for all, and cut back restrictions on the amount of private farms Cubans could own. In addition to all of this, he also began to take a softer approach to dissent in his country. Instead of long prison terms that Fidel implemented for protesters, Raul changed the state's policy to detain protesters for a few hours or days rather than years in prison. He also limited the amount of time government leaders could serve. In 2011, he called for two five-year term limits for senior government and party officials. He also made the historic decision to establish diplomatic relations with the United States and welcomed then U.S. President Barack Obama to Cuba for a state visit. It was the first time a sitting U.S. president visited the island nation since Fidel's 1959 revolution. But Raul's presidency hasn't only been one of progress. Under his rule, the nation's economy has also grown at a rather slow pace. As Raul's last term comes to a close, many Cubans hope his successor can follow through on the reforms he was unable to complete. Which brings us back to today and the nation's election that just took place on April 19th. Then Vice President and Castro loyalist Miguel Diaz-Canel was selected by the nation's legislative body, the National Assembly, to become the next president of Cuba. But what exactly could his presidency mean for the island? Little is known about how much Diaz-Canel will change the island nation, or if he'll run the nation the way it's been run for the last 59 years. While he was previously seen as a moderate who once said he'd be more responsive to the public's concerns, just last year, a video from a high-level communist meeting was leaked, where he was heard lashing out against political dissidents, the media, and foreign embassies. They have some platforms, for example, in Cuba, their platform, digital is very aggressive against the revolution, we're going to close it. We're going to close the platform digital. Y que se arme el escándalo que se quieran mal, que digan que censuramos, está bien. Aquí todo el mundo censura. Aquí todo el mundo censura. He's also not expected to ease tensions with the U.S. either. He recently rejected the U.S.'s demands to change its economic and political systems. And while he will be the first non-Castro president in over 59 years, Raúl Castro will remain the secretary of the Communist Party for the years to come. 
position that wields just as much influence as the presidency in the country. So what do you think? Will Cuba's new president be a force for change, or will he implement more of the same policies of the last six decades? Thanks for watching Now This World, and please don't forget to like and subscribe for more every week.